Welcome to video number three of the AP Biology series. So this is unit one, chemistry of life. And today's focus is going to be on carbohydrates and proteins. So let's start with carbohydrates. First, let's see uh, what you might remember about carbohydrates from past experience. So what are carbohydrates used for? What are they composed of in terms of elements? What is the hydrogen oxygen ratio you usually find in carbohydrates? What's the name of a monomer of a carbohydrate? How are larger chains of carbohydrates uh, formed? And what are the names of those larger chains? Carbohydrates are used primarily for energy storage and structural support. They're composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. The hydrogen-oxygen ratio that you usually find in carbohydrates is approximately 2 to 1. So for example, C6H12O6, you see that there are twice as many hydrogens as there are oxygens. Um, this is also true of water, right? There are two hydrogens and one oxygen. And that's where that name comes from, carbohydrates. But we'll look at the structure of some carbohydrates later, and you'll see that it's not just carbon atoms surrounded by water. So we'll look at the structure later. The monomer, the building block of a carbohydrate, is called a monosaccharide. The examples of monosaccharides you should be familiar with are glucose, fructose, galactose, ribose, and deoxyribose. You can get larger chains built from those building blocks, from those monosaccharides, through the process of dehydration synthesis, which is the same process we've seen um, in the intro to macromolecules because it's the same in all of our macromolecules. The name of just two monomers come together of carbohydrates is called disaccharides. Examples of that include sucrose and lactose. Oligosaccharides are when there are a few monosaccharides connected together. And then polysaccharides are when you have many, many, many uh, monosaccharides connected together. And those examples are starch, glycogen, and cellulose. So let's take a closer look at the monomers of carbohydrates, which are called monosaccharides. Here are two examples, glucose and fructose. Take a look at these molecules and determine their molecular formulas. Also try to figure out how would you know that these are carbohydrates. So the molecular formula of both glucose and fructose is C6H12O6. Because they have the same molecular formula, but they have different structures, that makes these two molecules isomers of one another. The molecular formula can also help us uh, determine that these are carbohydrates. It can help us with that because we can see that there are the three atoms of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, right? Those three types of atoms are in all carbohydrates. Um, it also can help us determine that ratio. So there are twice as many hydrogens as there are oxygens in these molecules, which gives us a clue that these are carbohydrates. What we have pictured here is the linear form of these molecules, but they also come in ring form. So if we took the fifth carbon, carbon number five, and looped that around to the double bonded oxygen, which is the carbonyl group of the uh, carbohydrate shown here. So if we loop that and bind, bound it with a covalent bond, that would form a ring. So we can see that here. So these are still molecules of glucose and fructose, just shown in a different form. So as a reminder, the process that builds monomers into polymers in all of the macromolecules is called dehydration synthesis. What is dehydration synthesis exactly? So dehydration synthesis is the process in which you form a covalent bond in between two molecules and water comes out in the process. So if you notice here, we have an OH from one monomer and an H from another monomer and that comes out and forms water, and what's left behind is a covalent bond. So because those two monomers are now connected with a covalent bond, that means they are now one molecule. So we had glucose and fructose to start, two molecules, and after dehydration synthesis, we now have one molecule of sucrose. So through the process of dehydration synthesis, we have monomers connecting to one another, forming polymers. So in the case of carbohydrates, these are polysaccharides. There are many different kinds of polysaccharides. Some examples include starch, glycogen, and cellulose listed here. How is it possible that we can have so many different kinds of polysaccharides? What allows for that variety? What allows for that variety of polymers is the type and order of monomers and connection points. And that applies to carbohydrates, but it applies to all of the macromolecules as well. 
So the example that we see here is the difference between these polymers um, is that we can have different monomers built together or they can be connected differently. So for example, the difference between starch and glycogen is that starch is in one straight line, whereas glycogen is branched. And in cellulose, you have long straight lines, but those monomers of glucose are alternating in sort of their orientation, so they're flipped up and down. So the connection points and the type of monomers that you have connecting to together can allow for all sorts of different polymers. All right, next up we're going to talk about our next macromolecule, which is proteins. So what is the elemental composition of proteins, and what are proteins good for? Proteins are made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, and they also include sulfur. Now, not all of the components of proteins, which are called amino acids, not all of them include sulfur, but proteins as a whole do include sulfur. Proteins do all sorts of things. They're really kind of the workhorse macromolecule here. They are enzymes that speed up chemical reaction. They help with defense, storage, transport, cellular communication, movement, and structural support. So throughout this year, we'll see the vast uh, variety of functions that proteins have. So let's take a look at the monomers of proteins. So the monomers of proteins are called amino acids, and these are all amino acids. So I want you to take a look at all of these amino acids and look at structurally what do they have in common and how do they differ. So all of these amino acids are similar in structure. So I've highlighted some of those similarities. They all have a central carbon, and remember carbon has four connection points. Three of those connection points are the same in all amino acids. What are those three connection points that are similar in all amino acids? So the similarities that we can see among all of these amino acids is three of the connection points off of that central carbon. There's a hydrogen, there's a carboxyl group, and there's an amino group. So the carboxyl group is pictured in yellow, and the amino group is pictured in orange. What's different about all of these molecules is that fourth connection point. That fourth connection point varies in every single different amino acid, and that variable portion is called the R group. So if you were to draw a just sort of standard amino acid, you would represent that variable group as just an R. So we have our central carbon, or alpha carbon, and connected to that are the three similarities, right? Our hydrogen, our amino group, our carboxyl group, and then that R group takes up that fourth connection point. So take a look at this diagram, and I want you to figure out how did amino acids get their name? Amino acids got their name from two of those shared connection points. On one side, there's an amino group, and on the other side, there's a carboxyl group. Now, if you remember from talking about functional groups, carboxyl groups are um, charged, so they have an acidic property to them. That hydrogen on the hydroxyl part of that carboxyl group can be donated. So this has an acidic property. So amino acids are named because they have an amino side and an acid side. So these are amino acids. Now that we know something about the building blocks of proteins, which are the monomers or amino acids, how do they become a protein? Or how do they become a polypeptide even? What's that process? So just like we saw in all the other macromolecules, the process is dehydration synthesis. So we have two monomers becoming a dimer and eventually a polymer. So in this case, we have two amino acids, which are the monomers of proteins, connecting together with dehydration synthesis to form a dipeptide. So that's a covalent bond, so we now have a single molecule. We started with two molecules and we ended up with one because they're now covalently bonded together. I want to point out that in the case of um, proteins, in the case of polypeptides, it's the carboxyl group of one amino acid that bonds to the amino group of another amino acid. So it's the OH from the carboxyl group and the H from the amino group that form that uh, bond. So during this video, you may have heard me referring to the sort of larger structure as either proteins or polypeptides. Those are actually different terms that I want to make sure that we go over the difference. So what do you think is the difference between a polypeptide and a protein? So a polypeptide is simply a string of amino acids, whereas a protein is sort of the final product. It's that string of amino acids that's folded in intricate ways and influences the function of the protein, and that final product is the protein.
So let's look at the process of um, going from just a string of amino acids to a final protein. So there are four major parts. There's primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure, and quaternary structure. Let's focus first of all on primary and secondary. What factors influence primary and secondary structure? So primary structure is simply the sequence of amino acids. This is the polypeptide chain. The secondary structure is influenced by hydrogen bonds within the backbone. So the amino groups of um, some amino acids and the carboxyl group of other amino acids form polar, um, are both polar and can form hydrogen bonds with each other. Now th that gives a sort of big picture shape to that section of the protein, and it can either be a pleated sheet like you see on the left, or it can be a spiral structure that's a helix. So those are the first two parts of it. Let's now go on to tertiary folding. What influences tertiary folding? Tertiary folding is determined by R group interactions. If you remember, a standard amino acid has three of its connection points to that central carbon that are all the same, and one that is variable. And that variable group is called the R group. And what that R group is has a big impact on its behavior. So we can categorize amino acids based on the structure and therefore behavior of those R groups. Some R groups are nonpolar, and you'll notice they have a lot of carbons and hydrogens in them, which are nonpolar bonds. Some of the R groups are polar. Here you see a lot of oxygens and uh, nitrogens, and there's even a sulfur in here. Remember how I was saying that sulfur is in proteins, but you'll notice it's not in every single amino acid. But because um, proteins are made up of a lot of amino acids, there's always going to be a cysteine somewhere in there, or almost always. And that's why proteins have sulfur in them, even though not every single amino acid has a sulfur in it. So in addition to nonpolar and polar R groups, they're also electrically charged R groups. They're both acidic that donate hydrogens and basic R groups that can accept a hydrogen. So why does this matter? What kind of impact does this have? So the third level of protein folding, called tertiary folding, has to do with R group interactions. If you take a look at this model, we're ignoring the backbone. The backbone is simply shown as that pink kind of squiggly line. So the backbone includes the central carbon, the hydrogen, the amino group, and the carboxyl group. What we're focusing on here is that fourth connection point to our alpha carbons, or the R groups. So remember, R groups can be variable, and that variety gives us all sorts of interactions within the protein. So if you have a positive R group and a negative R group, those are charged, oppositely charged R groups, those can attract each other. We see that in the ionic bond in the upper left. If you have several nonpolar R groups, they tend to form hydrophobic regions that will um, fold into the inside of the protein. And the reason that's happening is they're staying away from the water that's on the outside of the protein. So those nonpolar regions that are primarily made up of carbon and hydrogen in the R groups fold into the inside. You can also have hydrogen bonding formed between um, partial positive and partial negative R groups. So this is between polar R groups that are interacting with hydrogen bonds. And finally, we talked about cysteine as that unique amino acid that has sulfur in it. If you have multiple cysteines in a protein, as you often do, that can actually form a covalent bond that will connect those amino acids very, very strongly, very, care, uh, very closely. So that's a, called a disulfide linkage pictured here. So far, we've talked about primary structure, secondary structure, and tertiary structure of a protein. And before we go on to quaternary structure, I want to talk about one more term, which is a protein domain. A domain is a structural and functional part of the protein. So you can see that pictured in blue in the primary and tertiary structure of this diagram. So that might be a region that has a specific function within the overall function of the protein as a whole. All right, the next definition that I want to go over that relates to quaternary structure is a subunit. What is a subunit? So a subunit is one component of a protein. A protein, a final protein, is often made up of multiple polypeptide chains. So in this case, the polypeptide chain pictured in A, B, and C is the orange portion of that quaternary structure. 
we would need three separate polypeptide chains, all folded in unique ways, to make the purple, green, and yellow subunits of that protein. So what factors influence that final structure, that final quaternary uh, protein structure? That has to do with how those subunits interact with each other. And finally, the question is, why do we care about all this? Why do we care so much about a protein's shape? We care about a protein's shape because shape influences function. This is yet another example of structure function. If we know something about how it's built, we can learn more about how it behaves. This is going to be really useful to us in looking at similarities and differences between proteins. It can also really help us understand if a protein isn't working, why not? What part of its structure has changed that's been influencing its function? All right, we're going to leave it there for today. Um, the next video is going to cover our last two macromolecules, which is lipids and nucleic acids.